So here we are, and one thing's for sure, if we had not left Connecticut, I wouldn't be here in Irvine with God's beautiful people here this morning, and so it really is a pleasure to be here as part of TM and to share with you this morning. I was thinking as I talked to Pastor Steve what I could share, I'll be with you for three weeks, and uh, I had the idea as I was thinking of Easter, Easter's kind of around the bend, but it's late this year. Lent doesn't even start for another month. Easter is like during the All-Star break. I mean, it's so far up. But I was, I was thinking of a few Easter's ago when I was preparing some messages, and I, I was trying to come up with a way to explain the gospel to, to the people that I knew would be in church and who don't go to church except during Easter. I was thinking, Lord, how can I explain the, the gospel of Jesus in a simple way that they'll get it? And I wrote down these three sentences that Jesus came to earth to teach us how to live right. And, and Jesus died on the cross to give us the power to live rightly. And then Jesus rose from the grave to give us the reason to live rightly. And I thought to myself, hmm, that, that'll preach. The story of Jesus in the Bible is a story of the greatest moral rescue mission that has ever been undertaken. This is the heart of Christianity. Here, here we are, us humans, lost in our sin, filled with selfishness, riddled with pride. You don't believe that? You don't believe that the Bible's doctrine of original sin is true? Just, just go to Joshua Tree National Park right now, and you'll see evidence of human sin. For three weeks, there was no supervision over that park during the government shutdown, right? They could have closed the park down, but they decided to keep it open. Guess what happened? Experts now say it will take three centuries, 300 years, to undo the damage that we sinful humans did to that park in three weeks. Things like cutting down ancient Joshua trees and defacing beautiful monuments with graffiti. Don't tell me the human heart is not sinful. The Bible is spot on when it describes us as we really are. But, but God loved us so much that he didn't want to lose us. And so he devised a plan to win us back to himself. And after centuries where he sent messengers to come and, 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 and tell us what this plan is, he finally brought it to pass when he himself came. Jesus came. I like your sign out here. Jesus is God's selfie. Because that's who Jesus is. God with skin on. And why did he come? How would God win us back? His strategy had three parts. Would you read it with me aloud? Uh, one more time. Read it with me. Jesus came to earth to teach us how to live rightly. Jesus died on the cross to give us the power to live rightly. Jesus rose from the grave to give us the reason to live rightly. Here it is, our three-week roadmap for the next couple of weeks that we'll be together. Let's pray together and then let's dive in and unpack the first idea this morning. Lord, we invite you to come and be our teacher. We need to be taught. We can't figure this out on our own. We're not smart enough. We're not clever enough. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that you come and open up our hearts and minds to your word and give us understanding that we would not have on our own. And Jesus, as you taught 2,000 years ago, come in our midst right now and teach us now because we need you to do that, Jesus. Help us to grow up in you. In your name we ask. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, most of us from Sunday school on uh, age on understand that Jesus came to earth to die on the cross for us. We get that, right? But why did he spend three years on the earth in, a, in his ministry? And the 30 years set up before he began. I mean, honestly, I'm not being snarky to say this. If all Jesus came to do was to die on the cross for us, he could have done that on a weekend. He could have flown in, taken the nails, risen from the grave on Sunday morning, been home by Sunday afternoon and picked up an NBA game. Hmm? Why did he stay for three years? What was the point of his ministry? I'll tell you what it was all about. School was in session. The Gospel of Matthew tells us what the point of Jesus' three-year ministry was. And Jesus went throughout all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Just as the Beatles had their great breakout moment when they appeared on the Ed Sullivan show, Jesus had his great breakout moment when he gathered with a small group of disciples early in his ministry on a mountainside. And there he delivered what is arguably the greatest sermon 
that human ears have ever heard. We call it today the Sermon on the Mount. And when that sermon was over, Matthew tells us that the crowds were astonished at his teaching. Because he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes and, and the Pharisees. And Jesus still has that effect on people today. Nobody, nobody in human history spoke as Jesus did. It's one of the many reasons I know he is who he said he is. You, do you remember where you were the first time you heard Jesus speak? If God were to become human and teach us how to live, Jesus is what he would sound like. So, why did Jesus focus so much on teaching? I want to give you three reasons why he did that that will apply to us today. Here's the first one. first reason that Jesus spent so much time teaching was to train the disciples. Jesus clearly intended to launch a movement after he was left. A lot of people say Jesus never planned uh, to leave the church behind. That's not true. Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, I'm sure Jesus didn't have in mind all the things that we humans have done with the church over the years, right? Did you hear the story about the guy who was uh, stranded on a desert island for a couple of years? And uh, when they rescued him, before they took him off the island, he showed them all the, all the things he had built during that time. He showed them the house that he had built. And then he built a little tavern and a health club. And right in the middle of the island, he built this church. And then there was another building next to the church. And they asked him what that was. And he said, oh, it's where I used to go to church. I'm sure Jesus didn't have in mind all the things we've done, all the division, all the denominations, all the infighting, all the scandals. But he did have in mind the church. It was there from the very beginning. And if you read the Gospels, you see what Jesus' strategy was. That he called together these 12 men. He called disciples. We call them the apostles. And he spent the bulk of his time doing what? He was training them to take over what he was going. You see it all over the place. Jesus said... You follow me and I'll teach you to be fishers of men. That's training. Jesus went out and he healed and he taught. And then he sent his disciples out on little training expeditions. Two by two. And they trained and they taught. And they healed people. Then they came back to Jesus and they debriefed. What is he doing? He's training them. At the feeding of the 5,000. Remember that story? The disciples come to Jesus as the sun is setting. It's the end of the day. They say, the Lord, send the crowds back or they're going to starve out here. And what does Jesus say to them? You give them something to eat. What's he doing? He's training them. And he's still training his men and women and children today. Each one of us in this room right here, each one of us has a call of God on his or her life. To grow God's kingdom wherever He's planted you in your little orbit of influence, your little oikos, if you've ever heard that phrase. God wants you to grow His kingdom in those areas with those people. For that to happen, He needs to grow His kingdom in you. Are you willing for that to happen? Are you willing for Jesus to come and train you and to teach you? Because Jesus sees more in you than you see in yourself. And He wants to take you further than you've ever been before. But for that, we have to allow Him to train us. There's a second reason, though, why Jesus spent so much time teaching. And it was this, to break up the stony soil of Israel's hearts. We cannot underestimate how, how cynical this generation was that Jesus came to. How far from God they were. It's interesting to observe that after three years of teaching tirelessly going up and down the land and preaching and doing miracles. After three years, Jesus' movement numbered, does anybody know how many were really together as, after Jesus' death? 120. After three years of teaching and all this power and all these miracles, 120! Baker Bookhouse, which is a major Christian publisher, came very close, they tell me, to publishing my purity devotion. They liked the proposal. But then they looked at my social media footprint and my 75 Twitter followers and my 250 Facebook friends. And you know what they said? Your platform is not big enough. 
We need to guarantee that we're going to sell 20,000 of these in the first year. It used to be that publishers' mission was to help find new voices and to launch them. It's not that way anymore. You have to have an audience, a ready-made audience that you bring to the publisher and then they'll think about it. Now, I'm encouraged to think that Jesus, after three years of, of, of ministry, had 120 followers. If Jesus, if his disciples had gathered up Jesus' teaching and come to a publisher back in the first century, and, then, and, and, and if they treated things like they do today, they would have looked at Jesus' 120 followers, and they would have said, this guy's not going anywhere. But then, G, then Peter, think about this. So Jesus has 120 followers. Peter goes and preaches a sermon on the church's birthday, the day of Pentecost. And how many people get saved? Anybody know? 3,000. I got a question for you. Was Peter a better preacher than Jesus? I don't think that's the case. I think what, what happened is that Peter was bringing in a harvest of seeds which Jesus had sown across the land through his preaching for three years. A great revival came when Christianity was launched. Jesus set it off with his preaching. That's the thing about, about teaching. When we share our faith with people, there's always two parts of it. There's the ability of the speaker. Mm -hmm. And you should be prepared when you share about Jesus with somebody. You shouldn't be sloppy. I don't want to hear anybody say, well, Jesus said, well, just rely on the Spirit and He'll give you the words. No, no, no. That was a very specific context. If you're ever arrested by the authorities and brought before governors and kings, then Jesus will give you the words you need to speak. If that's not the context, then you need to prepare yourself to share Jesus with others. That's what Peter says. Always be prepared to make a defense. If somebody asks you why you're a Christian. So there's the ability of the speaker, but what's the second part of communication? There's always the receptivity of the listener, yes? And if you're a listener whose heart is as hard as granite, it doesn't matter how good the speaker is. It's not gonna make a dent in your faith. It's not gonna move the needle one bit, at least that we, we can see. Now this doesn't mean that, that that time is wasted. Are we gonna say that Jesus wasted his time preaching for those three years? What's going on? I love this verse from, from Jeremiah. Read it, read it aloud with me if you can see it. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. This explains what's going on here. Have you ever had to break apart concrete? Have you ever taken out a patio or a broken up sidewalk? It's not easy. My first church, let me tell you a quick story. My first church, I was a pastor of a country church north of Minneapolis in the Midwest. And country churches back then had their own cemeteries. And uh, in our particular church, it was the tradition for the trustees to dig their own graves by hand whenever there was a funeral. And I got into town and, and I said, why do you do that? And the trustee said, well, it's more personal that way. And I thought about it, I said, this is silliness. The family doesn't know how the hole gets there. What, get a backhoe in there. Well, in the winter, it's, it was especially interesting how they, how they dug out these graves. <laughs> and I did this once, and I said, I'm done with this. This is not in my job description. The, they're farmers, so they have used tractor tires hanging around. They burn a huge tractor fire over the grave all night. And the idea was that it would soften up the soil. But you get out there the next morning, kick off the tire, you go down with your shovel, it like softened up maybe two inches. <laughs> and we're talking Minnesota. You remember that polar vortex that came down just a couple weeks ago? And, and you all looked at that and went, ah! We're talking three feet of frost, of frozen earth you've got to cut through. So the shovels don't work, so guess what you have to use? Pickaxes. So there we were. Pickaxing. And, it, and it's like, like bringing a hammer down on steel. Clink, clink. Hundreds of times trying to, to, to break through. I vowed at that moment that next winter I was going to find out who the sickly ones in, were in the church and go put straw over their graves. I wasn't taking any chances. But finally, after an hour or so, it happened. Thunk! 
you broke through the last bit of frozen earth and you hit soil again. And that was like angels singing and you could dig the rest of them with a shovel. Now I got a question for you. Let's say that it takes a hundred swings of the pickaxe to get through to the soft soil. Which is the most important swing? Don't say number 100. Because number 100 is only good because of the 99 that went before it. Everyone is important. Boom! Boom! That's how it is in the kingdom of God. You got somebody who has a very hard of heart. Don't give up. Keep praying. Keep sharing. Don't be obnoxious about it. We're to be fools for Christ, not jerks. <laughs> yes? But I'm encouraged by Jesus' Jesus' example. Never stop sharing your faith. God's word never comes back void. Things are happening that you can't even see. One thing's for sure, if you never share your faith, if you never preach the word, guess what you'll never have? You'll never have a harvest in that case. Here's a third reason why Jesus taught so much. Why did Jesus spend so much time teaching? To correct the lifeless tradition and bad teaching that had poisoned people's minds. There's a reason that people in Jesus' time, why their hearts were so stony. They had never heard God's word taught clearly and compellingly. It, God's word was buried under mountains of rubbish and tradition and false teaching. Here God gives us a vibrant, life-giving faith. And what do we do? What do we humans do? We turn it into a lifeless, dead religion. God, God comes and lights a fire in our midst. And we build a fireplace around it. Put out the fire and worship the bricks. God comes and he gives us ten commandments. We turn around and make them into 600. Here's God. He comes to us and says, remember the Sabbath day. I don't want you to do any work on this day. Children, I want you to rest. And can't you see God saying that with a smile? Because he loves us. But what, the, what do we do? What do the legalists do? We say, and here's what God means by that. You can't walk more than a mile on the Sabbath day because that would be work. And, and, and if your neighbor needs help, if something happens, he gets his camel stuck in a, in, in a ditch somewhere, you can't help him because that would be work. And, and wipe that smile off your face because if you're smiling, you must not be up to any good. And, and God is unhappy if he finds you happy. That's how people think. And so Jesus comes on the scene and he sees all this and he, that's why he has to roll up his sleeves and he has to get down to work and start teaching. There are so many places as you read the gospel where they mucked up the simplicity of God's word. Think of, think of marriage. By Jesus' time, the religious leaders taught that a man could divorce his wife if she burned his toast. You can divorce your wife at the drop of a hat. And Jesus came along and he said, no. He points him all the way back to Genesis and says, from the beginning, God said, a man shall leave his father and a woman her home and they'll become one flesh. And what God has joined, let no one separate. Prayer, they bucked up prayer. The Pharisees believed that God was impressed if you stood on a street corner and used lots of big fancy words. Oh, most benevolent deity. And Jesus said, no, that's not what prayer is. Go into your house. Go into a room. Shut the door. Get in secret with your Heavenly Father. That's how you'll be heard. Those, those that were lost in sin, people that didn't go to church, that lived reprobate lives, the religious people of the time, got that all wrong. They thought that those people like that, they're unclean. Stay away from them. They'll contaminate you. And what did Jesus do? He hung out with those people. He went down to Dunkin' Donuts and he had coffee with those people. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, No, you've got it all wrong. The same sin that's in them is in you. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, you'd be in the same fix as they are. So rather than sneering at them and shaking your finger at them, why don't you love them back to life? And the greatest area where Jesus had to come and correct them because of the bad teaching was regarding who the Messiah would be. The Old Testament is very clear that the Messiah would come as a suffering servant. It's right there in Genesis. The servant would bruise the heel of God's deliverer. 
He would have his hands and feet pierced, David said. Isaiah said he would bear our griefs and carry our sorrows. And yet, by the time Jesus came, they had the Pharisee out to be some kind of avenger who would come and defeat the nasty Romans and set up his kingdom. And Jesus said, no, I'll show you what the Messiah is. And then he gave his life for us and let them butcher him on a cross. Jesus came to earth to teach us how to live rightly. And let's be clear, friends, we're not talking just about them 2,000 years ago. Guess who we're talking about today? Raise your hand. We're talking about us. Because each of these three things we've talked about, guess what? We need them to happen in our lives as well. Do we need training? You and I need Jesus to come and train us? Hey, if we're, gonna, if we're going to grow up spiritually, then yes, we need to allow Jesus to train us, to teach us. It's not going to happen by accident. A lot of people think that time is what makes us into mature Christians. Is that true? If you're a Christian long enough, you'll just automatically be mature? No. I've been a pastor most of my life. I've known people who, who've been Christians for 30 years, 40 years, and guess what? They're just as ornery as they were on day one of their faith. I'm not saying they're not saved. We're not saved by our works. We're saved by faith. But the tragedy is that, that they have wasted three or four decades of their lives by not taking Jesus' hand and getting on that moral journey with Him. That spiritual adventure where He says, I want to come into your life and I want to teach you how to love like me, how to experience joy like me, how to live like me. And they won't do it doesn't happen by accident. How are we trained then? Jesus told us in the Sermon of the Mount, if you hear my teaching and put it into practice, you shall be like a man who built his house on rock. And the storms came and the winds blew and the rains fell and the streams rose. They could not bring that house down. That's what we need. Jesus needs to train us. And then just like them, our hearts get hard and need breaking up. Is that true? Do our hearts get hard? Have you ever experienced your heart, your heart getting hard toward God? It happens. That's what sin does to us. What will soften us up, what will make us receptive to God and not resistant to God, is regular exposure to His Word. That is what will break up our stony hearts. God's Word is like a hammer, Jeremiah said. So the Spirit of God comes and takes the hammer of the Word of God and starts pounding on our hearts so that we can be recreated and become like the Son of God. Say this after me. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God to make us like the Son of God. It's why we need to be taught. And then just like them 2,000 years ago, we do the same thing. We allow lifeless traditions and bad teaching to poison us. Once vibrant churches, once strong churches are dying all across our country right now, all across LA, churches are dying because of tradition and bad teaching. There are congregations right now, they will close in a year or two if they do not change the way they do things. I don't mean the gospel. The gospel never changes. We don't change that. Each generation that comes along needs Jesus Christ. The millennials need Jesus, just like Gen X needs Jesus, just like the baby boomers, boomers need, need Jesus. But the packaging, the gospel always comes in packaging. We use technology today. We sing songs that are written today, newer songs. And if we don't change the packaging, what's going to happen? It's like this. It's like this little... What do you call these here in California? Cuties? I thought they were clementines, but cutie is a nicer word. So our tradition, the gospel is like the, 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 the part, the fruit, the part we need. That's the gospel. And, and the packaging is like our traditions, how we share the gospel with people. That changes from generation to generation. But you know what happens is, is people in churches today, they, they, 
They take the gospel, and guess what they do with it? I thought this would be quicker. <laughs> Somebody play that Jeopardy theme song, did it? We take the gospel, and we go, ah, don't need that, and we keep this. And there are churches dying right now. Because they keep speaking the seven last words of the church. You know what the seven last words of the church are? We've never done it that way before. Think about it. And so there are churches who are not willing to change their music, not willing to adopt technology, not willing to try new programming, not willing to rearrange elements in their service. And, and in a year or two, those churches will be dead rather than passing on the faith in Jesus to the next generation. What a legacy. Don't you want to stand before Jesus and say, hey Lord, I killed our church. <laughs> no. And there are churches right now all across the country and all across LA who are dying. There used to be once vibrant churches dying, not because of tradition, but because of bad, poisonous teaching that has seeped in. My ministry, Train Yourself Ministry, deals a lot with sexuality issues right now. And I'll tell you what, this area right now, the church has got, to, has got to stand up and point to the truth of God because it is so life-giving, male and female and marriage. And yet, culture comes along in its leather jacket and is pushing the church against the wall and saying, we don't agree with your idea of sexuality. And there are whole churches, denominations, that are going, oh, we'll change. Maybe we got it wrong. Maybe God changed his mind. We'll change. Churches everywhere you look that are dying because of bad teaching. They've taken the truth and simplicity of God's word and said, we don't need that. Oh, friends, we're, we're, we're just like them. Jesus taught us to show us how desperately we need the word of God. Man does not live by bread alone. Or sexual identity alone. Or cars alone. Or what college you go to alone. Or what sports team you follow on. Man lives by every word that comes from God. As we wrap up, I want to give you three quick ideas of how you can grow in your relationship with the Bible. My challenge to you, my friends, is that you go deeper with God in your relationship with His Word. But how do you do it? I want to give you a target as we close, a way to evaluate where you're at right now with God's Word. There are three deepening layers that we go through as we grow up in Christ in regards to our relationship with God's Word. And they're all modeled by Jesus in that interesting story where He's tempted by the devil in the wilderness. We'll go through this really quickly. First part of the story, Matthew 4, 1-4. to And Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and nights, He was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. By every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here Jesus is demonstrating level one of Bible knowledge. It's this, thinking biblically. This is basic elementary grade school stuff. First place you've got to arrive is you've got to learn how to think biblically. How did Jesus show he could think biblically? Because he knew the book. He knew his way around God's word. He could quote verses that he had memorized. Here Satan came and pushed on him in this area, and Jesus could call to mind verses that apply to that. Can you do that? My heart is so concerned as a pastor because I see so much Bible illiteracy in the church. Christians who don't know their Bibles. So how do you get to this level of thinking biblically? The answer is very simple. This is not complicated. This is not rocket science. You don't need a PhD for this. Are you ready? How do you think you grow in thinking biblically? Well, you guys are good. <laughs> you have to read! You gotta open up the book! And don't say, I don't like to read. I can't read. You, you can read. You just read. If you have a true disability when it comes to reading, then guess what you can do? You can listen to God's Word. You can put it on your playlist. That's how they did it in the first century. They didn't have scrolls. They didn't have books. They went to church. They heard it. They memorized it. 
If you want to learn to think biblically, this is what you need to do. You've got to get the words into your short-term memory so they can move into your long-term memory. And that's when the magic starts to happen. That's when you start to grow. And this should become a regular, constant discipline in your life. You spending time with God's Word every day. How, how frequently does temptation come to you? Daily, weekly, monthly. Daily? How frequently does your sin nature push against you? Daily, weekly, monthly. Daily? How frequently does the world try and swoon you with its siren song? Daily, weekly, monthly. Uh, why would you think that you don't have to train in God's Word daily then? If Jesus needed to do it, guess what? So do we. That's just level one. Most Christians aren't even at level one. But Jesus shows the second level in the next part of the story. When the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. On their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Here is level two. I'm going deeper in God's word. We have to learn to think theologically. <clears throat> Jesus not only knew the words, but he knew the doctrine of the words. He knew how the words should fit together and what they meant. And why is that important? Because guess who else can think biblically? Satan. Satan comes and, and he can quote the Bible and he can think biblically better than you or I can. But Jesus would have none of it. Because he so knew the Word of God and how it all fit together that he could spot error from a mile away and send him packing. This needs to be something that you and I can do as well, my friends. How do you flex your theological muscles. You can't just read. Now you've got to start thinking about what you're reading. You have to reflect. We are to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Come, let us reason together, God says through Isaiah. I read an article. Here's why this is important. I read an article this week that said almost half of millennial Christians think evangelism is wrong. Now before us older Christians start going, oh, tsk, tsk, you millennials, let's stop acting as though evangelism is easy for us. Let's figure out what the problem is with this. Is it, a, is it that they're not thinking biblically? I don't think that's the problem. I think the millennials know that Jesus said, go and make disciples. They know the Bible verses. They've heard the sermons. I think it's a theological problem. Here we live in a culture that is postmodern, that doesn't believe in truth, especially religious truth. Here we live in a culture that is multicultural, where it's drilled into us all day long that no culture is better than another culture. And who are you to think that your way, your philosophy, your religion is better than anybody else's? You bigot. You're arrogant. You get drilled this, into this all day long, and here comes Jesus and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to heaven by me. How are you going to bridge that gap and figure that out? You're going to have to think. You're going to have to spend some deep time going, okay, why would Jesus tell me to witness for him? What is special about Jesus that is special about nobody else? And as you start to think, answers will begin to come. Nobody spoke like Jesus. Nobody lived like Jesus. He's the only sinless man that's walked this earth. Nobody loved like Jesus. He treated the people of his time who were outcasts, kicked to the curb. He saw their value. Women and, and foreigners and refugees and slaves. And no one gave his life like Jesus. And nobody rose from the grave like Jesus. And nobody can change our lives for the better like Jesus Christ can. If you hear my words and put them into practice, you'll be like a man or a woman who builds her house on rock. It's a thinking problem. But we don't stop there. The final point comes here. and know we got to wrap up. The devil took him to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, all these I'll give you. Just fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said, be gone. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. Here's level three. We have to learn to think transformationally. <coughs> Jesus had a knowledge of the words. He had a knowledge of what the words meant, how they fit together. 
And he also had the knowledge of what the words were meant to produce inside our hearts. They're meant to transform us. God did not give us his word to fill our brains full of data, but to fill our hearts full of the love of God in Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, If I understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, but have not love, I am nothing. We have to think transformation. We have to realize that God's word in my life is meant to transform me, to make me like Jesus. It doesn't matter how many Bible studies you go to. It doesn't matter that you can quote hundreds of Bible verses. It doesn't matter that you can score a hundred on Bible trivia quizzes. If the grace and love of Christ isn't flowing from, a, from you, then all that time is wasted. How do I reach this point of thinking transformationally? I need to respond. Read, reflect, and respond. If you come to God's Word like W.C. Fields, looking for loopholes, if you come to God's Word like Thomas Jefferson with a pair of scissors, this I like, I'll keep this, but I'm cutting this out and throwing this away. You'll never experience the transforming power of God's Word in your life. My friends, how is the Lord challenging you today? Would you take this one minute right now, and I want you to review your notes, if you would. And I want you to identify one truth, one scripture, one thing that you think God is asking you to do because you spent this time this morning in God's Word. I didn't come here to waste time this morning, and I hope you didn't either. I want you going home with one thing that you and God are going to work on this week. Take one minute, and then write one sentence at the bottom of your note sheet and identify what that one thing is. I'm going to give you one minute as the worship team comes up and then I'll pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word today. I thank you for our attentiveness to your word. I thank you that your spirit is here. And I pray that we'll become people of the book again. There is a famine of hearing God's word on our land. And, and Lord, I pray that it won't be with us. I pray that we grow in your word. We're building our lives on your word. And we're able to share your word with our family, our friends, and our culture. That you'll make us bolder than we've ever been in our lives. Jesus, fill us with your light and power. Change us. You, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away, Jesus said. So may we commit from this day forward to think biblically, to think theologically, to think transformationally. And wherever we're at on that path, Lord God, move us forward by your grace and in your power, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.